Okay, today we're going to talk about bar graphs and histograms, which are very, very similar to each other. In fact, it's very common for people to think that a bar graph and a histogram are the same thing, but they're actually slightly different. So I want you to pay close attention to the differences so that you know which is which. Okay, so now first of all, a bar graph is used for categorical data. That's very important. Do you remember what that means? That means data that is separated into categories. Okay, it consists of separated bars, and that's also important. Okay, although, you know, for the reasons why, well, it's just kind of semantic, it's just that that's one quick way to tell if you have a bar graph or a histogram. It's not the best way, but it's a quick way, is that if the bars are separated, it must be a bar graph. Because with histograms, the bars are usually connected right next to each other. Okay, so it consists of separated bars. The length of which represents the amount of data points in each category. Okay, this can be measured in terms of frequency. Relative frequency. or proportion slash percentage. And finally, the bars can be oriented vertically, which is the most common, or horizontally, if you prefer. Okay, so let's do an example of a bar graph. Here's an example from page 51 of the textbook, example 2.5. Okay, there were 146 billion, no, sorry, that's a million, 100, of course, there's not even that many people in the world. Okay, 146 million, 267,000, 580 Facebook users. Okay. 
okay? And some statistician has wanted to break these up into age categories. So you see that they've chosen three categories. The first category represents ages 13 to 25. The second category represents ages 26 to 44. And the third category represents ages 45 to 64. Okay, and then they put the number of Facebook users in each category. That's called the frequency I want you to remember. Okay, relative frequency. I want you to remember what that means. Relative frequency would be frequency divided by the total number. Okay, so we're actually going to do that in a few minutes. All right, so now I'm going to show you a bar graph of this data. Now, if we wanted to graph this <coughs> by frequency, which I will write here, okay, then in that case, this right here would be about 65,000 <clears throat> now look how many belong to the category here's the category right there 13 to 25 look how many there are 65,000 oh, sorry that's not sorry 65 million 82,280 so that purple bar is going just a little bit above that line you can't really tell but it is okay um, let me move this word frequency out of our way. Put it like that. Okay, and then this bar down here would represent about 50 million. And this bar right down here would represent about 20 million. I'm rounding off a little bit, but that's basically what it would be. Okay? And so that's one way to do a bar graph. Now, notice that the way it is pictured here, <coughs> it doesn't show you the exact height of each bar. And sometimes that's what they give you. I have also seen, and this is really nice, where they actually write the exact height at the top of each bar so you don't have to try to estimate when you're looking at it you look at that and you say oh that's about 65 million okay but it's nice if they actually write for you well it's exactly 65 million 82,280 okay so I'm going to go ahead and add those to these bars. Okay, and that's a bar graph. Now, that one is made using the frequency. Okay, but I want to show you that we could also do it using relative frequency. And so what that means, I want to remind you of that. Let me write relative frequency here it's going to change the numbers so I want you to remember what relative frequency is relative frequency is the frequency divided by the total number of data points okay so in this case for the category 13 to 25 Instead of having the height of the bar be 65 million, 82,280, it will instead be that number, 
divided by this number. Okay, so let me let me write that out. If we take sixty five million eighty two thousand two hundred and eighty and we divide that by the total one hundred and forty six million two sixty seven thousand five eighty. I'm going to have to round off, okay, because this is a it's a repeating decimal. That comes out to be about zero point. Um, I don't know. I'll, I'll go ahead and put. Um, let's just do two decimal places. Okay, it's actually point four 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 nine five three and so on. So let's round off to two decimal places. Okay. So this number over here, uh, not this number, I mean to say this bar over here would have a height of 0 0.45. Okay, I've rounded off. And that would be because of the rounding off. That bar would stop right at that line perfectly. Okay, let's do the next category. So we take 53 million 300,200 and divide it by the total. And I'll round this off to two decimal places as well. That comes out to equal 0 0.36. Okay, so I'll label this as 0 0.35, and the bar goes just a little bit above that. Okay, this one, of course, would be 0 0.40, and this would be 0 0.30. I'll just label these all. Okay, and this would be 0 0.36 would be the height of that. And then let's find the relative frequency for the third category. <clears throat> we take 27 million, 885,100, divide it by the total. And we come out with, after rounding off to two decimal places, 0 0.19. Okay, so that's the bar graph by relative frequency. And I want you to notice something that's very important. When I did it first by frequency, and then I decided to switch to relative frequency, did you notice that I never erased the bars? And I didn't have to redraw the bars? The only thing I had to change was the scale on the y-axis. And that's pretty interesting. Whatever you want to use to represent the data, whether it's frequency or relative frequency or percentage, that does not at all change the shape of the graph or the height of the bars. The only thing that changes is the scale on the y-axis. Okay? If we wanted to do this by proportion or percentage, then I don't have to change anything at all other than just erasing these decimals and turning those decimal numbers into percentage numbers. And I would put a percent sign here after each of these probably. There's no need to do that over here along the y-axis because you already have it written right there. And this is the way it's presented in the book, although in the book they don't put the height at the top of each bar, which I think is a good idea to do.
Okay, so that's a bar graph. Next we're going to talk about histogram. Before we do though, I just want to point out what is kind of obvious, that relative frequency and uh, percentage are essentially the same thing. Did you notice that? Like for the 45 percent, when when I had it listed as relative frequency, it was 0.45, and when I have it listed as percentage, it's 45. So they're essentially the same thing. The only difference is the placement of the decimal point. So relative frequency and percentage are both a type of proportion. Okay, so so when someone says proportion, that doesn't have to mean percentage. That might mean relative frequency. Here, here uh, the way it is in the book, we know that they're doing percentage because they said they put that percent symbol right there. Okay, but the way I had it just before this where it was relative frequency, you could also call that a proportion as well. Okay, so relative frequency, um, some people call that percentage or percent frequency because the only difference is the decimal point and you could even call that um, relative frequency is also called the probability as well we'll get into that later though and those are all types of proportions but just frequency is not a proportion at all okay that's just a, a raw number okay let's move on to histogram Okay, a histogram is similar to a bar graph, let's say similar in appearance, to a bar graph. Comma, except that it can also be used to represent continuous data, not just categorical data. Now, because the data might be continuous, then in this case, it's not proper to say that each bar represents a category because it might not be categorical data. So the proper wording here is to say each bar represents an interval. Okay, you might say, well, what does it matter if you say category or interval? Um, you know, there's an argument to be made for that, I guess, but it's very important to, if you want to really understand this stuff, it's important to use the words properly, and you don't want to use the word category if it's not categorical data. Okay, all right, um, <clears throat> like a bar graph, um, the lengths of the bars can represent uh, either frequency or relative frequency. 
and based about what we discussed just a few minutes ago, I won't I won't bother writing um, proportion slash percentage as a third possibility because we just discussed just a short while ago that uh, relative frequency and percentage are are both types of proportions, and so they are more or less the same. The only difference is the the appearance of a decimal point or not. Okay. All right, now, unlike a bar graph, the bars in a histogram are contiguous. which means adjoining. Okay, and that's because if you have continuous data, well, let's say this. If you have categorical data, then those are discrete. Do you remember that? Discrete data. So there's a jump from one category to the other. But in continuous data, if you separate that into intervals, there's not actually a jump from one to the other. They flow continuously from one into the other. And that's why the bars are drawn so that they're connected to each other because it's a continuous flow from one interval into another. Okay, so let's do um, an example of a histogram they're a little bit more complicated you're going to see because here's the thing with categorical data it's usually easy to decide on categories if you have continuous data and you're going to separate it into intervals then it's not always obvious uh, what each interval should represent okay and so some thought has to be put into that i'm going to type out a hundred numbers that represent the heights of male semi-professional soccer players. Okay, this is coming right out of example 2.8 on page 55. Okay, now what we need to do, there's the 100 numbers, okay. What we need to do is decide where we want to start our first interval and where we want to end our last interval and how wide each interval should be in between which is going to be determined by how many bars we want to make okay so we need to figure these things out okay we need to we need to find a good starting point for the first interval. Pay close attention to these rules, okay? So what we do is we look at our data and we see how precise is the data. That means how many decimal places is the data point that has the most decimal places. Okay, so what I see here is that there's some data, like the 60 here, that has no decimal places. And then there's some, like the 60.5, that has one decimal place. So I scan the data to see if there's any that has two decimal places. And there's not. All of them have either none or one. Okay, so the highest level of precision that we have is one decimal place okay whoops so notice that the highest level of precision in the data 
is one decimal place. Okay, and you want your measurements of the intervals to have one more decimal place of precision. Let me write that down. We want our intervals to have one additional decimal place of precision. So we want to use two decimal places. for our intervals. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the number 5 in the second decimal place. So I'm going to use the number 0 .05. It's a 5 in the second decimal place. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract that from the smallest data point that we have. Okay? So find the smallest data point and subtract 0.05. So the smallest data point is 60. We subtract 0 0.05. And what's that going to give us? That's going to give us 59.95. And that's going to be our starting point. for the first interval. And there's a reason why we're doing this. And I haven't mentioned it yet. I want to make sure I say this because it's important. You don't want any of your data points to land on a boundary between intervals. That's why we put one additional decimal place of precision. And also, we don't just use the smallest number as our beginning. We subtract a little bit from it so that the first interval will begin just a little bit before the smallest number. And if the first interval begins a little bit before the smallest number, then the smallest number will not be on the boundary and because we are using one more decimal place of precision to mark out the intervals, then none of the data points are going to land on any of the boundaries. Okay? All right, so that's how you find the starting point. The next thing is we find our ending point for the last interval. Okay? Maybe what I'm going to do here is, so, so let's keep track of this. Let's write over here. Let's write start first interval at 59.95. Okay? Alright. Now we're going to find the 
end of our last interval. Okay, so next we determine the ending point for the last interval. And what we do is we find the largest data point and add 0 0.05. The largest data point is 74 and we add 0 0.05 and that's going to give us 74.05 so that our largest data point doesn't land right on the last interval. Okay, that's going to be our ending point. So I'll write up here end last interval at 74.05. Okay. Now the next step is to decide how many bars you want to separate this data into? How many intervals do we want to have? And we'll use that to decide how wide each interval is. Okay, so next decide how many intervals We want and use this to calculate the width of each interval. And there's no rule about how many intervals you should have. But just remember, you don't want too few and you don't want too many. If you have too few intervals, then your data is going to be crushed all together. Like the extreme would be to just have one interval. And in, and in that case, you're not going to be able to see any patterns at all because it will just be one really tall bar. Okay, and you don't want to have a hundred intervals either because, well, for instance, here there's a hundred data points. If you have a hundred intervals, you know, many of them are just going to have one number in them, and that's not very explanatory either. It will just be a whole bunch of intervals that are almost all the same height as each other. So you want something in between, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to be reasonable and we're going to pick 8, okay? So let's have 8 intervals. Okay, then the width of each interval should be okay and here's how you figure it out you take the distance from the end to from the beginning to the end so you take where the intervals are going to end where the last interval ends and subtract where does the first interval start and that tells you the distance from the far left hand side all the way to the far right hand side. That tells you the distance from the beginning to the end. And then you divide that 
by how many intervals you want. Okay, and in this case, it comes out to 1.76. Okay. Now, if we want to, we can round that off. Each bar doesn't have to be 1.76 in width. Okay, we can round that off to 2. And that's what they do uh, in the book. Okay, so here's how it's going to end up looking. So um, let's say here, width of each interval. The important thing is that we don't want any of the interval points, uh, sorry, any of the data points to land on a boundary between two intervals. So if that happens, if, if I round that 1.76 off to 2, and if that caused one of the data points to land on a boundary between intervals, then I would go back and not round it off. Okay? But this one's already been worked out, and I know that will be safe to go ahead and take that 1.76 and round it off to 2. Okay? So here's going to be our boundary points. Okay, so we are going to start at 59.95. That's going to be the first boundary point. Okay, and then we add 2 to get to the next one. So what would the next boundary point be? it would be 61.95. Uh, I better not make it too big in my picture or else I'll run out of room. 61.95. Okay, and then the next one we add to, the next one will be 63.95. And then the next one will be 65.95. And then 67. 0.95. That's the first four intervals. And then 69.95. And then 71.95. And then 73.95. How many do we have so far? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So one more. Now watch what's going to happen. We expected to have everything end at 74.05. It's not going to. And that's because I took that number 1.76 and I rounded it off to 2. So it's actually going to end up stopping at 75.95. Okay. And that's because this number was originally 1.76 for the width, but I rounded that off to 2. And so if we start at 59.95 and we take eight, 8 steps of length 2, then we don't end up at 74.05. We end up at 75.95. And that's perfectly fine. Okay. All right, and then you divide the data <coughs> into those intervals. So the first interval will contain how many points? It will go up to, well, right there, right? That's going to be the first interval. So we'll have to decide if we're going to do this by frequency or relative frequency. OK. So we will draw a bar. And the height of that bar will either be 5, because that's how many numbers are in that, or it'll be 5 divided by 100, which is 0 0.05, depending on if we want to do frequency or relative frequency. Or if we want to do percentage, it would be 
well, 5% again. The frequency and the percentage will always come out to be the same when there's 100 data points. Okay, and the next interval goes from 61.95 to 63.95, and that is going to be right here. And so we'll draw a bar that has a height of 3 if we want to do frequency, or 3 divided by 100, which is 0 0.03, if we want to do relative frequency. Okay, and now I'm going to show you the final picture. And there's the final picture for the histogram. Graph by relative frequency. Okay. And you can see the, uh, the boundary points between the intervals are clearly marked. And they've clearly marked the height of each bar in this picture, which I appreciate. Okay. Notice how the bars are touching each other. They're adjoining. That's, the, that's your key that this is a histogram and not a bar graph. Okay. But... I want you to know that that's not the only difference, okay? The, the other difference is that the first one, the bar graph, was categorical data, and this one is continuous data because this is heights. The other one was ages. Ages is a categorical measurement because we only measure ages by whole numbers. If you're, if someone says, a, if if, um, if you're older than 24, then the next choice is 25. We don't we don't say I'm 24.17 years old. I mean we could, but we don't. Okay, so that's categorical data. Heights is continuous data because you actually can measure it to any level of precision you want. Now here they decided to only measure it to the tens place, one decimal point, but height can be measured to 20 decimal places if you want so it's continuous data and that's the real reason uh, the real difference between a bar graph and a histogram bar graphs are for categorical data histograms are for continuous data okay